So today we're going to be talking about GUI part one. So up to this point in the class, when you think about it, we've only really been dealing with controls like a button, a label, text boxes, rich text boxes, and that's it. Um, so we've been be able to create some pretty good applications with just those basic controls. And also now we've finally learned enough about C Sharp and the syntax and objects and classes that we can start writing some more meaningful applications. And in order to do that, we're going to have to start you know, kind of dipping into this toolbox over here and understanding more of our GUI controls that we can use. So that's what today's lecture is all about, is just start going through and how you use and what you can use in our toolbox over here. So in our GUI here, everything is going to be event driven. So button clicks, label clicks, you know, mouse hover, all those kinds of things, uh, even just, you know, timers going off. So everything we do in our GUI is event driven. And so in order for that to work, there has to be a ways of sort of linking up, you know, an event to the code that's going to be called to handle that event. And so in the past, you know, I've dragged a button on here, we've double clicked it and I've said, "Okay, you know, this button click has been linked to this button via let's uh, take a look at our solution explorer." we had this designer file over here and we came in here and we took a look and it said okay you know here's my button click event and when it gets clicked call this method this button one click method and I said okay it just ignore the syntax we will explain that at a later date well today is the later date so what we're gonna learn about first before we get into some of the other controls is the concept of delegates so delegates you use in C-sharp when you want to pass methods as arguments to other methods and it's just basically a way of keeping a reference to a method in a variable. So since we can actually put a method reference inside of a variable we can pass that around or we can assign it. So that's really how this code works here is with the use of delegates. So let's go ahead and just write some sample code now using delegates. So to write a delegate, first I'm going to say a public delegate. So use the delegate keyword string my delegate. I'm going to say int i. <clears throat> so what this says is that you're defining a method signature here for the type of method that can be held in the delegate that is instantiated through my delegate. So you use the delegate keyword. This is the return type of the method. The name of the delegate is my delegate. The method that I, the signature also that it has to have a parameter of one integer. So let's write a method that meets this signature. And I think it'll all come together and make a little bit more sense. So for instance, let's say private string my method int j return j dot to string just a simple method here but what you'll notice here is that here's my delegate it says okay the method that can be contained within this delegate has to return a string so my method returns a string and it has to take in one parameter of type integer and so this method meets the signature for this delegate so now I can actually instantiate my delegate. So I can come down here and let's create a variable of type my delegate. So just like you would create an integer or double or any other type, I can just say my delegate, you know, and this is holds, you know, a delegate, doesn't matter. And what you do is you say new equals, you can see it pop pops up with my delegate. Now when I open this up you can see it actually tells me the method signature that needs to be passed in here. So you can see it's return type of string has to have one argument of int passed in. Well what method meets that? My method meets that. So all I have to do is pass that in here and so now this holds delegate holds a reference to my method. So that's how you do that. And so now, holds delegate, if I were to say holds delegate and pass in something like three, this is exactly the same as saying my method and passing in three. These are exactly the same. And so where this comes in handy now is that you can either assign it to an event or I could pass it 
to another method. So for instance, let's say private void, you know, test for a method. And what we can do now is I can say my delegate del something to this nature. And so what we're saying is, is that when you call test, I expect you to pass into me a my a method contained within this my delegate. So you'll notice I can say holds delegate here and pass it in. And the reason you'd want to do this, so let's say I created a class here. And so the user of my class instantiates it and they call this test method. And let's call this, you know, something like sort, for instance. And so they call my sort method, and then what I allow them to do maybe is pass in the sorting algorithm that I'm going to use. And so all I have to do is say del now, something to this nature, and I'm going to call the method that they passed into me. I don't know what method it is, but I'm just knowing that they're going to pass me in some sort of sorting algorithm. Maybe this either holds an ascending or descending sort algorithm. And then I just call del, and that calls whatever method they passed into me in my sort method. So this is how we assign the button click event to a method, namely button one underscore click. So let's come over here now and let's take a look at how this code actually looks. So before I said, you know, just, you know, ignore the syntax, you know, we'll get to that. Well, so what this says is, is we're and we're actually going to be talking about events in, in the next lecture. So this is just an event. You can see that little lightning bulb. So we're saying, okay, so what do we want to have happen when this event gets raised? Well, we don't have to assign an event, right? If I were to drag this button over and I run the application, I click button two, nothing happens because no delegate has been assigned to the click event. So you don't have to assign that. But when you do assign it, I'm going to say, okay, so they need to know what happens. So this is contained within this button class. So they don't know what should happen when it gets clicked. You need to assign what should happen when this click event gets gets raised. Just like my sorting algorithm, I didn't know which sorting algorithm the user wanted to apply. Well, they don't know what should happen when you click this button. How do they know what, to, what method to call? Well, you pass it in via a delegate. And so since you pass it into them, that's how when you click the button, all they do is they actually call a method. And it's because it was passed in via this delegate. So if you look at the syntax here, here's my event. And I say, OK, and you'll notice this event, it's going to take, when I say plus equal, it's going to take an event handler as a delegate that gets passed into it. And sure enough, event handler is a delegate. So we can actually right click on this, go to definition, and you can see that Microsoft has defined this delegate called event handler. And so the click event, the method signature for that click event, your method has to return a void, take in an object and an event args. So hopefully this looks really familiar to you. When we come back to our form here, you'll notice that our button clicks always returned void, had an object sender and event args E. Well, that's how it knew how to create this method for you. It was able to figure that out because it had that delegate defined for it. So when you double click the button, it knew what type of delegate had to be assigned to it. It knew the method signature. So that's how it created this for you because we've got this delegate void event handler with object and event args in it. So when we come back to our designer now, it's that we're saying, okay, we're going to instantiate a new delegate here. And so now we instantiated the delegate, all we're doing now is passing in our method button click one. And so that's the syntax. So we're passing a delegate into the click event. And all it does now is it's just calling our method that we passed into it. So that's how delegates work. So I'm going to go ahead and clean up some of the code here so we don't have to see that anymore. So now let's just kind of go through now and just start, you know, adding and dropping in some, some controls and going through some of the main properties to learn how to use them. So before we even do that, let's just talk about Windows in general. So the one thing you want to remember is that Windows are just classes, just like you instantiate a button, just like you instantiate the random object, you know, or a label. Oh, just always remember that a window is a class. And if you just remember that, they're not too bad to use. So let's go ahead and instantiate a new item here. Or you could do a Windows form. And so this is going to pop up with another window. 
and you'll see form1.cs that's fine let's go ahead and add it to our project now and then I'll just drag some you know controls on here so we know what our form 2 looks like versus our form 1 so now in our form let's say whenever you double let's say when you click this button we want to pop up our other form so we've got form 2 over here and remember it's just a class so you instantiate it just like you would any other object so let's do it. So as I start typing, you can see that form 2 is going to pop up in my IntelliSense. So form 2, let's call it frm2 equals a new frm2. So now we've instantiated that object, so now we can use it. So we can say form2 dot, and here's some of the methods that we can use. So the main one we're going to be using is either show or show dialog. So let's try show first and show you what the difference is between that and show dialog. So when this runs and I click my button, what you'll notice now is that I can actually switch back and forth between these forms because all it's done is shown this form. So it's just like having two almost separate programs running at the same time now. This other window runs independently of this one. When I close down, you know, I just only have this one window left. However, if I do show dialog, what you use show dialog for is, hey, Mr. User, here's another window, and I'm forcing you to complete something on this other window before I'll allow you to go back to this main window. So you're trying to get information from them. So when I open this back up, you'll notice that I cannot go back to my main window. It forces me to do something here before it allows me to come back to my code here. So the next thing I want to show you, if I do string s equals something like this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a breakpoint right here, and let's uh, I'll comment this out, and let's change this to show, and let's set a breakpoint here, and let's show you the difference how the code actually executes. So it comes in here, and you'll notice that. It didn't hit that. Why didn't my? What happened to my breakpoint there? And so, let's go ahead and hit F5. Let's try that one more time. Let me close this down. So let's run the application. Let's click on my button. There we go. So hit my breakpoint. I instantiate my form two. Now you'll notice when I hit F10 here, it's going to immediately jump to this next line of code. And sure enough, it jumped down to this next line of code, and it also, you can see, displayed Form 2. So now if I hit F5, it just continues on running, and it shows us you know, both of our Windows forms. So what you need to take away from that is that it showed this other form and immediately kept executing the rest of our code here. So it popped up this form and kept executing the rest of the code. Now the difference between that and show dialog, when I run this here, I do F10. Now when I do F10 now, you'll notice that it actually stops debugging. And it actually just pops up my other window. So you can see I can't go back, but now as soon as I close this down, it just takes me back into the debugger and continues executing on. So there's a really subtle difference there between show and show dialog. Show just immediately continues executing on the rest of the lines in this method, where show dialog literally just pauses right here until you're done doing this form, and then it continues executing on. Now to go back to the point that our forms, our, our windows here are just classes, let's take a look at the code, you know, and create you know a public method or a public attribute for instance you know string s name something to that nature and this could be a you know a private attribute with a public property but let's just take let's just do this real fast with a public attribute and so now all I can do is remember it's just an object so now I can come in here and sure enough I can get access to my first name to my s name attribute it's a public attribute it's a class so I could set this and then you know uh, so I could set that before and then show show dialog what I can also do is let's drag a text box on here and so I've got this text box called text box one let's take a look at the code and now let's create a public string property called you know get name something to that nature and what we're going to do in here is we're going to have a get, maybe it's read only, and what this is going to return is our textbox1.text. And so what we've done is we've said, okay, the user is going to pop up 
in the second window, enter in a name, and then when it comes back to my main window now, I'm going to call this property to access my text box on my other form. So what we could do now is we could do show dialog, and then you know let's go one step further over here, and let's make them have submitted this name here. And so we'll put a button on here that's our submit button. Behind this submit button, what we're going to do is we're going to have a private attribute called be, you know, submitted name. And this is a boolean. And it's defaulted to false, but all we're going to do is we're going to say this equal to true and then this dot hide. And so what we've done now is this is a way of verifying that the user is actually not just closed down the application, but they have submitted this username's text box. So when we come back to our window now, we do show dialog, and we've expected them to have entered the name. So what we could do is we can come in here and say, hey, did the user enter their name? So when we bring this up, we access this get name property, or sorry, the be submitted, so we need to create a property for that. I skipped that step. So it's a public bool, you know, did submit return be submitted name. And so we call, you know, did submit here. Whoops, I forgot to do the git. There we go. So I've created a public property called did submit. So I just come over here and say did submit equals true. And if they did, now I know that they did input that text box. And I, you know, I, I could have also validated it. But now I just access that name property over here called get name. And so I can access that, you know, and, and go ahead and say, you know, string s name equals get name. So I've opened up my dialog. I've verified that they did enter a username, and now I can pull it back. So let's set a debug point here. We run this, open up the button. We can see we're show dialog. So I press F10. It's going to open up my dialog. I enter an ABC for my name. I have submitted it, so it hides this window. And you notice how my debugging now comes right back. Did I submit this? Yes, I did. And so I can go ahead and pull the first name across, ABC. So that's how you can communicate between your various windows. So what you need to think of is that this form here, make it self-contained. It doesn't know about any other windows except for itself. So it doesn't know anything about the outside world. It's self-contained. It just knows about itself. So because of that, the way you need to set it up is in a way that it has all the information passed into it via properties and the way that you return information is via properties. And then so our, our form, our main form here, it's smart enough to know about the other forms so it instantiates them and then we know that we're going to be able to communicate via these properties to set or get information from this other window. But this other window only knows about itself, where this main window knows about it, and it kind of has more of the smarts to do that. So that's how we can pass information back and forth. Now the last thing I want to talk about here is every time we click this button, we're reinstantiating this window. So what happens is, is when I come in here and I click my button, and I type you know a name and then close it down if I open this back up it's instantiating a brand new copy of this window which maybe that's what you want maybe it isn't but you'll notice that it erases the state of that window so that name is no longer in here so if we want that state to be saved what we're gonna need to do is create a class level variable so we come up here so we create the object reference and then I'm gonna come in here to the constructor of our form one actually instantiate form two and now I can delete this here so I've got my class level variable I've instantiated it and now I can use it and so now when I close it down and open back up the state will be saved because I'm using the exact same window so ABC close this down open this back up and it's the same object being opened again where before we were reinstantiating it so we're essentially wiping it out
So there's kind of a subtle difference there that you need to be aware of. You know, and again, you just do you just do it for whatever meets your particular problem. So let's come back to our, our, our main form now. Close this down. And what we're going to do is we're just going to start going through some different controls and learning how to use them. So let's make this give us a little bit more room. Just kind of move these to the side. So we're pretty familiar with buttons and labels and text boxes, things like that. So first, let's just go ahead and take a look at some properties for just our window in general. So I'm going to go ahead and just alphabetize these. Just I just like it. I find it easier to find these. So the first thing is the accept button. And the accept button, you'll notice, is the button that you can press on the main form that is the enter key. So if I just press enter, you can see it was the exact same thing as if I clicked button one and it opened up this other form for me. So that's what the accept button can do. So maybe you have a submit button on here that you want the user to be able to click on or to have been able to just press enter to submit that button. And so just like submit, there's also a cancel button. So we can come down here to cancel button, and sure enough, there's button two. So now this is my accept, and this is my cancel button. So some more th properties that are helpful. We can come down here, and again, just go through and start, you know, oh, enabled, disabled, here's my fonts. Um, I come down here, maybe let's take a look at form border size. So first it's set to sizable. Maybe we want fixed dialog. So when we run that with fixed dialog, it's going to be a little bit different to where I can't size it anymore like I could before. So maybe you want that to where the user shouldn't be able to resize it. You have fixed 3D, just changes the look of it a little bit. We've got um, fixed tool window. So you notice that way I can't expand or minimize it anymore. Again, you just figure out what your scenario or what your problem is you're trying to solve and then you just change the border style to meet that. There is the text property. So you'll notice this is our caption. So as I change this here, it gets changed in our caption up here. We have start position. So let's say we always wanted it to start center screen. We can check that to center screen. You'll notice it starts up right in the center screen. Imagine that. So now we can also do you know center to the parent form, Windows default location, et cetera, et cetera, where a lot of times I always just set this to center screen so I, I, the user would be familiar for where you pop it up. Um, we can come back up a uh, control box. So if I were to set this to false, you notice it gets rid of the minimize, maximize, and, and uh, close buttons. However, if you get rid of these, you're going to need to add in some sort of your own functionality now, or else that the user would have no way, you know, of closing down your form. We can also change the cursor, so we can come in here, and I can pick a new cursor. So anywhere over my form, if I change this to a cross, you can see everywhere I go over here now, my cursor has been changed. So maybe you need to change it to like a wait window, for instance. You know, if you're doing a long query to a database. We can also change the maximize box here. So if I set this to false, you'll notice it kind of gets rid of the maximize box here, it disables it. There's also the minimize box. We can also change the opacity. So we can create kind of a ghost-like window. If I set this to 50%, you can see it actually makes it see-through. I'm not sure where you'd want to use this effect, but now you know you can do it. So you can create cool ghost windows. And then the last one, which is really important that you always want to set for your other windows, is this show and task bar. So that's what pops up down here on my task bar. So for instance, let's uh, go back to form two, sorry, form two, and let's set the show and task bar to false. And so when I run this, and I open up the second window, you'll notice it did not open up a second little taskbar item here. But now if I were to set this to true and run it, and now when I open this up, you can see it actually opened up a whole other task window here. And that's not what we want, right? You don't need 50 of these opening up every time just because you opened a different window. So also now with our form, We've got lots of various events, so we can handle the load. You know, right after the constructor is called, the load is called. Um, you know, did the user click on our form? Did they drag something activated? Was the form closed, or is it closing? So maybe before the user ever closes down, we want to ask them, "Hey, you forgot to save your data. You know, did you really mean to do this?" So you could handle the form closing event, give them that feedback, and then stop the closing event if they really didn't mean to. 
So there's lots of different events. And there was a painting application we've seen before that you know we used like mouse move and then we'll, we'll look at another painting application in just a second. So now let's go over to our WPF window and take a look. So I've got another application here for WPF. And so now we're going to be taking a look at a window. And in WPF, make sure, because if I click in here, I've actually clicked on the grid. And so you want to be careful and actually click the window so we can take a look at the window's properties versus the grid itself. And what's nice about going between WPF and Windows Forms is you're going to notice a lot of the exact same properties. So your knowledge really just transfers right over. But let's just kind of scroll down here. So for instance, we can change you know, the back color if we want. Um, it actually works out easier if we do the color here. So we've got brushes. So here's our background. I can add a new you know, brush color here if I want. And you know, I can you know, do something like this. And let's get rid of, you know, let's make that a little bit nicer. So that's the background color. Let's change it back to name. Uh, the same just like is in Windows Forms. Here's our cursor. So exactly the same. You just you know come in here and change your cursor. We can do the icon. As I scroll down here we can set the icon. And so if I had had any icons in, in my application already loaded in the solution, this little drop down would actually come up with any icons. Just like I have an icon here for uh, Visual Studio, that's what we'd be setting for the application. So a professional application, you would want to set an icon that would pop up in the taskbar. We have something called resize mode. And so sometimes between Windows Forms and WPF, they'll be kind of the same thing, but a little bit different naming. Here, you just whether or not you can resize your window, so you can set your resize mode. We've got show in taskbar. So here's our show in taskbar. So again, always want to set that for our non-main window. In WPF, it's called title, if you're changing the caption up here versus text in Windows Forms. You also have your Windows startup location. So here's our Windows startup location that we can set. Uh, window style was, you know, you can see here's that whether you wanted a tool window or, you know, 3D board window, things of that nature. So again, just go through the different properties in your window and just kind of get familiar with what you can set. So the next thing we want to talk about now is text boxes. So let's go back to my Windows Forms and let's drag a text box onto our, our window here. So we'll drag that on, make it a little bit larger. We'll take a look at all the properties for our text box. So whenever you're using a text box on your form, generally you're getting some input from the user so we always want to make sure we validate our user input but there's also some things that we can set right within the properties to help the user enter the correct data just to begin with so for instance character casing so if I want to I can force the user to always be entering uppercase characters so you can see no matter what I do it's always uppercase so again if you expect them to enter in an uppercase or lowercase value just force the text to be that way. The next one that you should always set is this max length. So if they're entering in a zip code or a social security number or a phone number or you know any sort of thing where you know how many digits, let's say they can only enter in two digits, we'll set the max length to two. And so now you'll notice how much I type, it always only allows me to set two digits. So let's say this text box is for first name and you're having them enter the first name and then submit the data to the database. So you're saving a record to this employee table in your database. Well, if you're saving this data to this table and there's a first name column in your database and this, the DBA only let 20 characters be inserted for first name, well then you would come over here and set max length 20, correct? Because why would you ever let them you know, enter something larger than your database can hold? So this way you don't even have to validate the length on your text box. It's taken care of for you here. Uh, what if they want to enter in a password? So we know you know username and password. Well you actually have this what's called a password character for your text box called password char right here. So if I set this to asterisk and then run it, you notice as I type it just types ta asterisks into my text box. So that's really easy on how you can set this up to a password. There's also read only. So right here, if I set read only to true, and I run this, you can see it's been set to read only. Now, if I set that to disabled versus read only, it 
just makes it look a little bit different. So let's go ahead and change this back. Oh, I've got to highlight that. Read only to false. But then we also have enabled to false. So now when I run it, you can see it's actually disabled the entire thing. I can't even you know click in there where I could even highlight it where I did is read only. So there's a little bit difference between enabled and is read only. So you just need to again use the one that makes sense for your particular item. So if I come in here, let's let's type some text in here. And I did that because we can deal with um, some text alignment. So you can notice I can, if I want to, I could you know center the text in my text box. Let's go ahead and jump over to WPF now. And if I drag a text box onto here, and we come, you know, let's sort it by name. So within WPF, we have things like, imagine that, max length. So we can always set, we're always going to want to set the max length for our text box. We have password char, just like we did. Let's scroll down here. Here's password char. Let's see, what did I break here? Oops, I must accidentally. So let's do that to 10. Come back to here. So now it's got my text box. You know this is the type here. And so you can set the password characters. We can set it to read only. Let's see. So in, in WPF, you'll notice that they've changed a lot of things like read only to is read only. And so they've actually made them verbs. So is enabled and is read only. So it's a little bit different um, in WPF than than than. Uh, Windows forms. Uh, we've also got text alignment, so we can set that. Now let's take a look at a label and a text block in WPF. And so here's our a label, and then we've also got something called a text block. And for the most part, they're exactly the same. Text blocks is a little bit more lightweight of a control. However, the thing that I like about text block is it allows us um, to what are, what's called text wrapping. And so you'll notice I've got what's called wrap or no wrap here, where my label does not allow me to do that. So let's go ahead and just type a whole bunch of characters here. And you'll notice that when I have is wrapping to true, see how it automatically wraps for you. So maybe, again, if you're pulling out a long you know, string from the database, you would use fill it up into a text block that you know can go ahead and wrap it in there, You know, if you don't know exactly how long that string is going to be. So now let's take a look at, for instance, let's look at, let me go ahead and clear some of this away, uh, group box. So we open up all WPF controls, and we can drag and drop a group box on here. And so a group box is our container. So then we can actually start dragging other items in, and now they belong to that group box. And you can see they're actually part of the content of our group box within that. So we could actually loop through all the controls in our group box. And the same thing in Windows Forms, when we come over here, we can see we've got these containers now. And so I can drag a group box on here. And so the group box has a nice little label up here at the top, so you can sort of group and organize. So when the user looks at this, they know that all of the things, you know, are suit maybe you put employee information here. And so first name, last name, you know, address, things of that nature. And then maybe another thing, group box, that says payment information. And so it's just a way of grouping things together. Another one that we can do is a panel. And so we can drag this on there. And the thing about a panel is it actually has scroll bars. So we can scroll up and down within our panel if we need you know, more room. So let's take a look at checkboxes. So we can take a look at checkboxes or radio buttons. And so for a checkbox, when we come over here, the checked is the main property that we're going to be dealing with. And you can see I, I can set this to true. And so in the code, I just say you know, checkbox one dot checked to see if it was actually the user had checked it or not. With my radio button, when we drag this over here, now a radio button, you only ever want, it, it, it's exclusive in the sense that only one can ever actually be checked at a time. So you'll notice if I come over here and set check to true, and then I run my application, oh, did I disable my, my window here? Oh, sure enough, I don't know when I did that. Let's go ahead and run this again, and you'll notice that since they're, they're automatically grouped together and only one can ever be checked at a time, and the reason that they're part of a group is because 
they have to be in a container. And so the container just happens to be this window. And so what I could also do is I could drag some radio buttons into a group box, for instance. And so this is going to create a new grouping. So when I run this, you can see that this group is independent from this group. So you just have to have some other grouping in order to be able to have multiple selections for your different group boxes. And so if we come over to WPF, the same thing is true. We're now, again, we've got our checkbox, except its property is going to be called is checked. And you set that to true, or sorry, is checked to true or false. And then we've got our radio buttons where we drag that over here. And so now my radio button, you can see I can set one of these to checked in order to set up that grouping. And it's going to be the same thing where now because it belongs to that container of the window, it's automatically created that group for us. And so that's the radio buttons for both Windows Forms and WPF. Let's see here, my radio button. In WPF, the other thing that we can do is when my radio buttons, if I drag another one over here, but I actually want these two to be part of a different group, there's actually this thing called group name. So let's call this ABC and set this radio box to ABC. And so if you set the group name, it's another way of making them independent and you don't have to actually put them in a separate container. So that's just another way that you can use the radio buttons. So we also have things like uh, image box, so we've worked with that before. So we've got your picture box, and then you just set the image of it. We did that in our dice game. And so those are some of the basic controls between Windows Forms and WPF. And there's actually another lecture on GUI Part 2 where we're going to some more of the complex controls. So now I want to talk about events and event handling for some of these new controls that we've learned about. So the first one I want to discuss is the mouse event handling. So on our windows we can actually raise an event every time the mouse gets moved. And so here's an application from the book figure 14.38 where if we run this we can see it's a painter application. We've kind of seen one of these before where we can actually just hold down the mouse and then start painting. And so in order to do this what they've done is they've came over here to our properties and they've clicked on events and you can notice that if we scroll down here, on the mouse down, we're going to set a Boolean variable that says, hey, we should start painting. On mouse up, we're going to release that Boolean variable. And then on mouse move, every time it moves, we're just going to go ahead and paint every time, you know, for holding the mouse, the mouse left button down. So that's some mouse event handling that we can do. Um, another uh, program we're going to take a look at now from the book is for event handling for text boxes. So inside of our text box here, if we come over here, there's various things that we can look at, various events we can look at for handling user input. And so on a text box, we've got these key down and key press and key up events. So key down and key press occur when the user presses the key, and then key up is when they released it. Now there's a subtle difference between key down and key press. So key down, if we take a look at it, we've got this E event args here for key event args. And for key press, when I come in here, it has key press event args. So notice how a different object is passed in between key down and key press. And so key down, if I say E dot, I can get information about this key that was clicked inside of our text box. And so key down, you would use this when you want to be able to handle special characters. And so we can figure out via the key code or key da data or key value, you know, which buttons were actually pressed. Or sorry, which uh, character was pressed from your keyboard. Now on the key press, if I say E dot, it gives us this key char property and we can here we can actually control user input. So for instance, let's say we only want to make allow the user to enter uh, numbers into our text box. They're entering in you know a quantity. Well, what we could do is is we could never even allow them to enter characters. We could come in here and look at e.keychar, 
And then we could actually use that character structure, that char dot, char dot, and we could say, you know, is a digit or is a letter or is a number. And so we could validate the character that just got pressed. And if it is, we could say e dot handled equals true. And so that would not allow that character to be printed in our text box. So going along these lines, let's look a, at a key demo from the book. And so what this does is it actually looks at those two methods, the key press and the key down events. So now I'm going to go and I'm just going to press the A on the keyboard. And so you'll notice that it, here it is dealing with the key pressed and down here is the key down events. So up here you can see that it just says key pressed equals A. Where down here you can see it's actually giving me all the information. Was the alt key pressed? Is the shift key being pressed? Uh, the key code is A. The key value is 65 which is our ASCII value. So if you ever need to figure out the ASCII value that's how you would do it. Now let's hold down shift and you'll notice that sure enough this down here tells me I can figure out whether or not the shift was pressed. Now if I hold down A at the same time you can see that yes A was held so here's lowercase a here's shift A so it's uppercase but this actually gives me the key code and here's the key value of 65. So let's close this down now and so for on my form they were handling the key press event and they were also handling the key down event and then the key up just erased the labels on the form and so they were just displaying the key char event the key property from my key press and then over here on key down they were just using this key event args to say hey was the shift key pressed here's the key code and here's the key data so that way we can actually just get some information about which key they got pressed so let's go ahead and close that one down so now what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to go through some examples now that I've created for you and again these are on canvas so the next concept is we want to talk about is dealing with timers so for instance on your math game you're gonna to have to have a timer going off every second that keeps track of the math game time so what we're gonna do here now is you'll notice that this is a WPF application and so what we're gonna do actually you know what let's start with the Windows form application that will be a little bit more straightforward. So let's create our timer now in our Windows form application. We're going to do the same thing in our WPF application. So our timer in Windows forms is just called timer and I'm going to call this my timer. And so now we need to actually instantiate the timer. So let's come up here and let's say my timer equals a new timer. And so now we can use it. So the first thing you want to do is set the interval in milliseconds for how often this timer should tick. So if I set it to 1000 milliseconds that goes off every second. And then what I need to do is I need to assign to the tick event which method I want to be called every time this tick goes off. And with when you're assigning event handlers, you actually use the plus equal sign because you can actually assign multiple methods to get called when the same event gets raised. And so I'm going to say new and it's going to say event handler and then my timer tick because this was actually already created for me right here. And so every time this timer gets ticked, it's going to call my timer. So let's do that one more time, but this time I'm going to comment this out, this my timer tick. And so let's redo it. So plus equals. And you can notice what it actually says is, hey, do you want to just tab to insert this my timer tick method? So if I press tab, it goes ahead and it actually just inserts in that same method that I commented out here, my timer tick. So it created it for me. So that's how you would create that tick method. It actually will just do it for you in the IntelliSense. So every time that timer goes off, it's going to call my timer tick. So let's delete this. And so now, when the user clicks this button here, we actually want the timer to start going off. So in order to have the timer activated, we just say my timer dot start. And so that will start our timer. And so now, when the timer goes off, what we're going to do is we're going to actually display to a label. So we come over here, and we've got a label that's just going to start ticking. Right here, you can see. And it's, when it goes off, I'm just going to start displaying the current date. And so when I run this and I click this button, 
you can see that my timer has been activated and every second that timer gets ticked and it runs that code that we assign to the method. So now we've learned about this timer class and so this time.now and we're going to take a look at that in just one more minute. We'll, we'll go over um, dates and times in detail in this WPF application that I've also created for you that we're actually going to go over a bunch of date and times. So back to our Windows application here now. The last thing I want to talk about is going over key press and how you would validate user input. So what you'll notice now when I run this application, let's scroll down a little bit. When I bring this up, I've got this text box. So if I come in here and I say I type in the letter A or D or S, you notice nothing happens in my text box. However, if I type the number 3, it allows that to be pressed. Or if I press the Enter key, you can see it actually ran this piece of code here for pressed the Enter key. So again, if I don't even want to allow the user to type any letters, so right now I'm typing some letters and it's not even putting those in the text box. So how did that work? Well, I handled the key press event on my text box. So every time that gets called, I've got this e.keychar that I can take a look at. And this is for Windows Forms. It's going to be slightly different in WPF Windows. And so I can look at the e.keychar and say, hey, was that a number? And you can see I'm actually taking the not of that. And I can say, does e.keychar not equal the backspace? So why am I doing that? Well, if I hadn't done that, and let's say I type in 33, it wouldn't allow them to actually create to do the backspace key, which you know obviously you want to allow them to do. And so what this is doing is it's saying, hey, only allow them to enter numbers or the backspace key. So if I did enter number or the backspace key, it just skips this piece of code and it just allows them to do the input. So did they do enter a number or the backspace key? Yes. So just continue executing down here. Okay, they entered a letter or something. So if they entered a letter, this is true now. And so it'll come in here and say e dot handled equals true. So this what's it prevents that text box from pr printing that character. And oh, by the way, I also do a second check that says, hey, did they press the enter key? So later on in your assignment for your math game, one of the things you'll have to do is, is you have to, a requirement is to allow the user to enter their guess. So, you know, what the user's guess was is they, you generate two random numbers, and so let's say it comes up with like two and four. So the user should type in six, and they have to actually press enter to submit their guess, or they can actually click the button. So how do you know that they pressed enter? Well, sure enough, on the key press, you can just say, hey, did they press the enter key? Now let's jump over to our WPF application. And so just remember on Windows Forms, you use the timer class to have a timer tick. So now let's take a look at our WPF application. Now in our WPF application, it's a little bit different for how we do timers. And so you need to be careful. And the reason you need to be careful is because there actually is a timer. So let's just do a timer my timer here. And again, remember I'm in WPF now. And you can see it doesn't know about this. So it says, okay, what did you really mean when you were creating this? And I get this little lightning bolt here. And it says, hey, did you really you know want me to add in you know system.threading here or system.timers? And so if I do that, this will work. But the problem is that this is actually going to execute on a separate thread than the user interface. And so you can't access any user interface elements within this timer tick methods. And I know that's a little bit confusing now because we haven't dealt with multiple threading, but it will make sense more. But just know with WPF, what we have to use is something called the dispatch timer. So you'll notice we have, it's called dispatcher timer, you know, my timer. So the way they actually, when they redid when uh, WPF, they said, okay, what we're going to have is something called a dispatcher, and its job, this class, is going to be to handle all of the events for our GUI interface. So button clicks, mouse moves, key press, all of those events have to go through what's called the dispatcher. 
So it handles all of these events. So it's a different paradigm in WPF than Windows Forms. So because of that, we can't just use the timer class. We have to use the dispatcher timer if when every time this timer goes off, we want to then update the user interface. So the difference between the dispatcher timer and the timer class that we're using is that timer, it was actually executing on a separate thread. And again, we'll learn about what that means later on. Where if you want to update the user interface, like every time it goes off, you would update the, the game timer in your math game, you need to make sure you use the dispatcher timer if you're using a WPF application. However, in a Windows Forms application, you can just use the timer class because it executes on the UI thread. And again, I know that's confusing, but we're going to go over that more when we get, go into um, threading in another lecture. So now that we've created this dispatcher timer, the object reference, let's actually instantiate the dispatch timer. So let's say new dispatcher timer. And now what we don't want it to do is to go off every second. So we're going to set its interval property. But you'll notice that interval is of type time span. We don't just pass in milliseconds. Because this timer actually gives you a different resolution that you can set. So what you do is you say time span dot. And then this is what gets set. So you can actually set it from, mil from minutes, from seconds, from ticks, from days. And so to do it exactly the same that we did before, what I could do is I could say from milliseconds and do 1,000. And that would be exactly the same how we did it in our Windows Forms. So this sets the interval to go off every one second. Well, another way we could do it is to say dot from seconds. And then we could just pass in one. So just two ways of doing the exact same thing. And then you'll notice that we need to say, okay, here's my timer tick. But you know what? Let's delete this. So we can make it do it for us. And now we're going to say my timer dot tick. The method I want to assign to the tick method is this my timer tick one. So press tab, and you can see it inserts that for me. And so let's delete this. And so whenever that timer goes off, let's just go ahead and we'll set. There's another label on the UI. And so we'll do the exact same thing, that it just keeps printing the current date time. Then when the user clicks this start timer button, we just now need to start it. So we can just say my timer dot start. So we just start the timer on our UI. And then there's also a my timer dot stop if you ever need to stop the timer from ticking. That's how you would do that. So Let's uh, minimize some of this code. So that's dealing with, with timers. And so before we deal with uh, dates and times, I want to just go over the preview key down now for our user input. So let me run this. Oh, it's broken. We'll have to run it in just a second. So here I've got this text box. And we want to validate the user input just like we did on our Windows Forms. So if we take a look what is being done here. It's a little bit different than our Windows Forms because this event args is different from Windows Forms to WPF. You also want to do this handle this preview key down in order to handle the user input, not just key down. You want preview key down. And so if we only want numbers to be entered, when we say e.key, this is actually based against an enumeration. So if we say e.key, this is an enumeration of type keys. And so we can say, hey, was this equal to key dot? And you can see that every key is actually listed out in here from our keyboard. So to only allow numbers to be entered, so I'm saying, hey, was any of the numbers from the top of the keyboard entered, or was any of the numbers on the keypad entered? If it is, then it actually just keeps executing. It prints those characters into my text box. However, if they did, like for instance, the letter A, then this is going to be true. And you'll see here that I do e.handled equals true. So I'm saying don't print that in. However, I am allowing if they're pressed the backspace key or the delete key, because we want to allow them to delete characters out of my text box here. So now let's come up for the last concept now. Let's deal with um, dates and times. 
So for some of your assignments, you're going to have to be dealing with the user entering dates and times. So for instance, the airline reservation system or the um, final group project, you know, the user is going to have to enter in dates. So on your final group project, you have to enter in a date for the invoice number. And so you have to this calendar control, the user has to select a date, or let's say you had um, maybe uh, you're creating a reporting application and you had to create a report over a given time span. And so we've got two classes and objects here that we can now use to manipulate dates and times. So the first one we're going to deal with is what's called the date time. So let's call this date time equals DT1 equals a new date time. And so now that we've instantiated this object, it can hold a date and time for us. So let's fill this up with a date and time. So to do that, you can actually then call a static property called now. And so this just sets this property to the current date and time. So you just add ac access this static property date time dot now. Then what we can do is we can create a second date time object, set it to the current date and time. And now let's go ahead and now that it's set to a, a current date time, let's say date time two dot add days for instance or we could add hours or milliseconds do whatever we want where we actually add a given amount of time so let's add three days to our date time so this is the current date time then we set the second object to the current date time but then we add three days to it so we actually put it out into the future and then if we want to manipulate or figure out the time between these two dates we can use this time span class and so you'll notice I've got all these methods when you say date time dot like add but we've also got subtract so we can say you know subtract a certain amount of time and so we're saying date my second date subtract that from my first date time and you can see if I look at my IntelliSense it actually returns a time span object and so that's why I can say TS now I can say TS dot whoops TS dot and I can get how many days were in that time span, hours, milliseconds, and I can actually figure out, you know, the different individual pieces of how much time there was a span between those two. So if I want to get, you know, the total days that occurred, this is going to return three because I had added three, so there was a three-day difference between my two days. Also with date times, you can format that you can see that I can do to local time, to long date stream, to long time stream, and you can also, you know, format it yourself if you wanted to. You could just even do four, you do uh, dot two string and pass in your own format um, to it in order to display the dates. So today we've gone over uh, various GUI controls, just kind of some basic ones, and we've also worked with timers and dates and times.